story nine of the crimson gardenia and other tales of adventure by rex beach this librivox recording is in the public domain story nine when the mail came in we didn't like montague prosser at first he was too clean he wore his virtue like a bathrobe flapping it in our faces it was whitewater kelly who undertook to mitigate him one day but being as the nuisance stood an even fathom high and had a double action football motion about him whitewater's endeavours kind of broke through the ice and he languished around in his bunk the next week while we sat up nights and changed his bandages yes monty was equally active at repartee or roughhouse and he knocked whitewater out from under his cap slick and clean just the way you snap a playing card out from under a coin which phenomenon terminated our tendencies to scoff and carp personally i didn't care if a man wants to wallow about in a disgusting daily debauch of cleanliness it is his privilege if he squanders the fleeting moments brushing teeth cleaning fingernails and such technicalities it stands to reason he won't have much time left to attend to his work and at the same time cultivate the essentials of life like smoking drinking and the proper valuation of a three-card draw but as i say it's up to him and outsiders who don't see merit in such a system shouldn't try to bust up his game unless they've got good footwork and a knockout punch it wasn't so much these physical refinements that riled us as the rarefied atmosphere of his general mental and moral altitudes to me there's eloquence and sentiment and romance and spiritual uplift in a real full-grown black-whiskered cuss-word it's a great help in a mountainous country profanity is like steam in a locomotive takes more to run you uphill than on the level and inasmuch as there's only a few men on the level a violent vocabulary is a necessity and appeals to me like a certificate of good character and general capability there wasn't a thing doing with prosser in the idiom line however his moral make-up was like his body big and sound and white and manicured and although his talk alongside of ours listened like it was skimmed and seminaried still when we got to know him we found that his verbal structures had vital organs and hair on their chest just like anybody else's and at the same time had the advantage of being fit to send through the mails he had left a widowed mother and come north on the main chance like the rest of us only he originated farther east what made the particular ten strike with us was the pride he took in that same mother he gloried in her and talked about her in that hushed and nervous way a man speaks about a real mother or a regular sweetheart we men folks liked him all the better for it i say we men for he was a shine with the women all nine of them the camp was fifteen hundred strong that winter over and above which was the aforesaid galaxy of nine stranded on their way up river to a dawson dance hall the yukon froze up and they had to winter with us of course there were the three married ladies too living with their husbands back on the birch ridge but we never saw them and they didn't count the others went to work at eckhart's theatre monty would have been right popular at eckert's he was a handsome lad but he couldn't see those people with a field glass they simply scandalized him to death i love to dance said he one night as we looked on and the music sends thrills through me but i won't do it why not i asked this is alaska be democratic you're not so awfully nice that a dance-hall girl will contaminate you oh it's not democracy that i lack nor contamination that i'm afraid of he replied it's the principle back of it all if we encourage these girls in the lives they lead we're just as bad as they are look here son when i quit salt water i left all that garbage and build water talk about guilt and responsibility behind the days are too short the nights are too cold and grub is too dear for me to spare time to theorize i take people the way i take work and play just as they come and i'd advise you to do the same 
no sir i won't associate with gamblers and crooks so why should i hobnob with these women they're worse than the men for all the gamblers have lost is their honesty every time i see these girls i think of the little mother back home it's awful suppose she saw me dancing with them well that's a bad line of talk and i couldn't say much of course when the actresses found out how he felt they came back at him strong but he wrapped himself up in his dignity and held himself aloof when he came to town so he didn't seem to mind it it was one afternoon in january cold and sharp that ollie Merceau's team went through the ice just below our camp she was a great dog puncher and had the best team in camp seven fine malamutes which she drove every day when the animals smelled our place they ran away and dragged her into the open water below the hot springs she was wet for ten minutes and by the time she had got out and stumbled to our bunk house she was all in another ten minutes with the quick at thirty below would have finished her but we rushed her in by the fire and made her drink a glass of hooch martin got her parka off somehow while i slashed the strings to her mucklucks and had her little feet rubbed red as berries before she'd quit apologizing for the trouble she'd made a fellow learns to watch toes pretty close in the winter lord stop your talk we said this is the first chance we have had to do anything for a lady in two years it's a darn right pleasure for us to take you in this way indeed she chattered well it isn't mutual and we all laughed we roused up a good fire and made her take off all the wet clothes she felt she could afford to then wrung them out and hung them up to dry we made her gulp down another whiskey too after which i gave her some footgear and she slipped into one of martin's mackinaw shirts we knew just how faint and shaky she felt but she was dead game and joked with us about it i never realized what a cute trick she was till i saw her in that great coarse blue shirt with her feet in beaded moccasins her yellow hair tousled and the sparkle of adventure in her bright eyes she stood out like a nugget by candlelight backed as she was by the dingy bark walls of our cabin i suppose it was a bad instant for prosser to appear he certainly cued in wrong and found the sight shocking to his plymouth rock proprieties the raw liquor we had forced on her had gone to her head a bit as it will when you're fresh from the cold and your stomach is empty so her face was flushed and had a pretty reckless daring look to it she had her feet high up on a chair too not so very high either where they were thawing out under the warmth of the oven and we were all laughing at her story of the mishap monty stopped on recognizing who she was while the surprise in his face gave way to disapproval we could see it as plain as if it was blazoned there in printer's ink and it sobered us the girl removed her feet and stood up miss marceau has just had an accident i began but i saw his eyes were fastened on the bottle on the table and i saw also that he knew what caused the fever in her cheeks too bad he said coldly if i can be of any assistance you'll find me down in the shaft house and out he walked i knew he didn't intend to be inhospitable that was just his infernal notion of decency and that he refused to be a party to anything as devilish as this look but it wasn't according to the alaska code and it was like a slap in the girl's face i am quite dry she said i'll be going now you will not you'll stay to supper and drive home by moonlight says we why you'd freeze in a mile and we made her listen to us during the meal prosser never opened his mouth except to put something into it but his manner was as full of language as an oration he didn't thaw out the way a man should when he sees strangers wading into the grub he's paid a dollar a pound for and when we'd finally sent the young woman off martin turned on him young feller said he and his eyes were black i've rattled around for thirty years and seen many a good and many a bad man but i never before seen such an intelligent damn fool as you are well, what do you mean said the boy you've broke about the only law that this here country boasts of the law of hospitality he didn't mean it that way i spoke up did you monty certainly not i'd help anybody out of trouble man or woman but i refuse to mix with that kind of people socially 
that kind of people yelled the old man and what's the matter with that kind of people you come creeping out of the milk and water east all pink and perfumed up and when you get into a bacon and beans country where people sweat instead of perspiring you wrinkle your nose like a calf and whine about the kind of people you find what do you know about people anyhow did you ever want to steal of course not said prosser who kept his temper did you ever want to drink whiskey so bad you couldn't stand it no did you ever want to kill a man no were you ever broke and friendless and hopeless why i can't say i ever was and you've never been downright hungry either where you didn't know if you'd ever eat again have you then what license have you got to blame people for the condition you find them in how do you know what brought this girl where she is oh i pity any woman who is adrift in the world if that's what you mean but i won't make a pet out of her just because she is friendless she must expect that when she chooses her life her kind are bad bad all through they must be not on your life decency runs deeper than the hives trouble with you said i you've got a juvenile standard things are all good or all bad in your eyes and you can't like a person unless the one overbalances the other when you are older you'll find that people are like gold mines with a thin streak of pay on bedrock and lots of hard digging above i didn't mean to be discourteous our man continued but i'll never change my feelings about such things mind you i'm not preaching nor asking you to change your habits all i want is a chance to live my own life clean the mail came in during march five hundred pounds of it and the camp went daffy monty had the dogs harnessed ten minutes after we got the news and we drove the four miles in seventeen minutes i've known men with sweethearts outside but i never knew one to act gladder than monty did at the thought of hearing from his mother you must come and see us when you make your pile he told me or what's better we'll go east together next spring and surprise her won't that be great we'll walk in on her in the summer twilight while she is working in her flower garden can't you just see the green trees and smell the good old smells of home the catbirds will be calling and the grass will be clean and sweet well i'm so tired of the cold and the snow and the white white mountains that i can hardly stand it he ran on in that vein all the way to town glad and hopeful and boyish and i wondered why with his earnestness and loyalty and broad shoulders he had never loved any woman but his mother when i was twenty-three my whole romantic system had been mangled and shredded from heart to gizzard still some men get their age all in a lump their boys up until the last minute then they get the rip van winkle while you wait this morning was bitter but the sourdoughs were lined up outside the store waiting their turns like a crowd of parsifal first-nighters so we fell in with the rest whipping our arms and stamping our moccasins till the chill ate into our very bones it took hours to sort the letters but not a man whimpered when you wait for vital news attention comes that chokes complaint there was no joking here nor that elephantine persiflage which marks rough men when they foregather in the wilderness they were the fellows who blazed the trail bearded shaggy and not pretty to look at for they all knew hardship and went out strong-hearted into this silent land jesting with danger and singing in the solitudes here in the presence of the mail they laid aside their cloaks of carelessness and saw one another bared to the quick timid with hunger for the wives and little ones behind there were a few like prosser in whom there was still the glamour of the northland and the mystery of the unknown but they were scattered and in their eyes the anxious light was growing also five months is a wearying time and silent suspense will sap the courage if only one could banish worry but the long unbearable nights when the mind leaps and scurries out into the voids of conjecture like sparks from a chimney well it's then you roll in your bunk and your sigh ain't from the snowshoe pain a half-frozen man in an ice-clogged dory had brought us our last news one october day just before the river stopped and now after five months the curtain parted again 
i saw mcgill the lawyer in the line ahead of me and noted the greyness of his cheeks the nervous way his lips worked and the futile wandering uselessness of his hands then i remembered when his letter came the fall before it said the wife was very low that the crisis was near and that they would write again in a few days he had lived this endless time with fear stalking at his shoulder he had lain down with it nightly and risen with it grinning at him in the slow cold dawn the boys had told me how well he fought it back week after week but now edging inch by inch toward the door behind which lay his message it got the best of him i wrung his hand and tried to say something i want to run away he quavered but i'm afraid to when we got in at last we met men coming out and in some faces we saw the marks of tragedy others smiled and these put heart into us old man tomlinson had four little girls back in idaho he got two letters one was a six months old tax receipt the other a laundry bill that meant three months more of silence when my turn came and i saw the writing of the little woman something gripped me by the throat while i saw my hands shake as if they belonged to somebody else my news was good though and i read it slowly some parts twice then at last when i looked up i found mcgill near me unconsciously we had both sought a quiet corner but he had sunk on to a box now as i glanced at him i saw what made me shiver the fear was there again naked and ugly for he held one lonesome letter and its inscription was in no woman's hand he had crouched there by my side all this time staring 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 at it afraid to read afraid to open it some men smile in their agony shifting their pitiful masks to the last others curse and no two will take their blows alike mcgill was plucking feebly at the end of his envelope tearing off tiny bits dropping the fragments at his feet now and then he stopped and when he did he shuddered buck up old pal i said then recognizing me he thrust the missive into my hand tell me for god's sake tell me quick i, I can't no wait, wait not yet don't tell me i'll know from your face they said she couldn't live but she had and he watched me so fiercely that when the light came into my face he snatched the letter from me like a madman oh give it to me give it to me i knew it i told you they couldn't fool me no sir i felt all the time she'd make it why i knew it in my marrow what's the date i inquired september thirtieth he said then as he realized how old it was he began to worry again why didn't they write later they must know i'll eat my heart out suppose she's had a relapse that's it they wrote too soon and now they don't dare tell me she got worse died months ago and they're afraid to let me know stop it i said and reasoned sanity back into him monty had taken his mail and run off like a puppy to feast in quiet so i went over to eckert's and had a drink sam winked at me as i came in a man was reading from a letter go on i'm interested said the proprietor the fellow was getting full pretty fast and was down to the garrulous stage but he began again dear husband i am sorry to hear that you have been so unfortunate but don't get discouraged i know you will make a good miner if you stick to it long enough don't worry about me i have rented the front room to a very nice man for fifteen dollars a week the papers here are full of a gold strike in siberia just across bering sea from where you are if you don't find something during the next two years why not try it over there for a couple that's what i call a persevering woman said eckert solemnly she's a business woman too said the husband all i ever got for that room was seven fifty a week it seemed i'd missed montague at the store but when the crowd came out ollie marceau found him away in at the back having gone there to be alone with his letters she saw the utter abandon and grief in his pose and the tears came to her eyes impulsively she went up and laid her hand on his bowed head she had followed the frontier enough to know the signs oh mr prosser she said i'm so sorry is it the little mother yes he answered without moving not 
not she hesitated i don't know the letters are up to the middle of december and she was very sick then with the quick sentiment of her kind the girl spoke to him forgetting herself her life his prejudice everything except the lonely little grey woman off there who had waited and longed just as such another had waited and longed for her and inasmuch as ollie had suffered before as this boy suffered now in her words there was a sweet sympathy and a perfect understanding it was very fine i think coming so from her and when the first shock had passed over he felt that here among all these rugged men there was no one to give him the comfort he craved except this child of the dance halls compassion and sympathy he could get from any of us but he was a boy and this was his first grief so he yearned for something more something subtler perhaps the delicate comprehension of a woman at any rate he wouldn't let her leave him and the tender-hearted lass poured out all the best her warm nature afforded in a few days he braced up however and stood his sorrow like the rest of us it made him more of a man in many ways for one thing he never scoffed now at any of the nine women which taken as an indication was good in fact i saw him several times with the marceau girl for he found her always ready and responsive and came to confide in her rather than in martin or me which was quite natural martin spoke about it first i hate to see em together so much said he one of em is going to fall in love sure and it won't be reciprocated none it would serve him right to get it hard but if she's hit it'll be too damn pitiful you and i will have to combine forces and beat him up i reckon the days were growing long and warm the hills were coming bare on the heights while the snow packed wet at midday when we went into town to sled out grub for the clean-up we found everybody else there for the same purpose so the sap began to run through the camp we were loading at the trading post the next day when i heard the name of ollie marceau it was a big-limbed fellow from alder creek talking and as he showed no liquor in his face what he said sounded all the worse i have heard as bad many a time without offence for there is no code of loyalty concerning these girls but ollie had got my sympathy somehow and i resented the remarks particularly the laughter so did prosser the puritan he looked up from his work white and dangerous don't talk that way about a girl he said to the stranger and it made a sensation among the crowd i never knew a man before with courage enough to kick in public on such subjects as it was the man said something so much worse that right there the front busted out of the tiger cage and for a few brief moments we were given over to chaos i had seen whitewater walloped and i knew how full of parlor tricks the kid was but this time he went insane he knocked that man off the counter at the first pass and climbed him with his hobnails as he lay on the floor a fight is a fight and a good thing for spectators and participants for it does more to keep down scurvy than anything i know of but the thud of those heavy boots into that helpless flesh sickened me and we rushed prosser out of there while he struggled like a maniac i never saw such a complete reversal of form somewhere away back yonder that boy's forefathers were pirates or cannibals or butchers when the fog had cleared out of his brain the reaction was just as powerful i took him alone while the others worked over the alder creek party and all at once my man fell apart like wet sawdust what made me do it what, what made me do it he cried i'm crazy why i tried to kill him and yet what he said is true that's the worst of it it's true think of it i fought for her what am i coming to after the clean-up we came to camp waiting for the river to break and the first boat to follow it was then that the suspense began to tell on our partner he read and re-read his letters but there was little hope in them and now with no work to do he grew nervous added to everything else our food ran short and we lived on scraps of whatever was left over from our winter grub steak just out of cussedness the break-up was ten days late the ten longest days i ever put in but eventually it came and a week later also came the mail 
we needed food and clothes we needed whiskey we needed news of the great distant world but all we thought of was our mail the boy had decided to go home we were sorry to see him leave too for he had the makings of a real man in him even if he shaved three times a week but no sooner was the steamer tied than he came plunging into my tent like a moose laughing and dancing in his first gladness the mother was well again later i went aboard to give him the last lonesome good wishes of the fellow who stays behind and fights along for another year the big freighter with her neat staterooms and long glass burdened tables awoke a perfect panic in me to be going with him to shake this cruel country and drift back to the home and the wife and the pies like mother made i found him on the top deck with the marceau girl who was saying good-bye to him there was a look about her i had never seen before and all at once the understanding and the bitter irony of it struck me this poor waif hadn't had enough to stand so love had come to her just as kink had predicted a hopeless love which she would have to fight the way she fought the whole world it made me bitter and cynical but i admired her nerve she was dressed for the sacrifice trim and well curried as a thousand dollar pony back of her smile though i saw the waiting tears and my heart bled spring is a fierce time for romance anyhow there wasn't time to say much so i squeezed monty's hand like a cider press god bless you lad you must come back to us i said but he shook his head and i heard the girl's breath catch i continued come on ollie i'll help you ashore we stood on the bank there together and watched the last of him tall and clear-cut against the white of the wheelhouse and it seemed to me when he had gone that something bright and vital and young had passed out of me leaving in its stead discouragement and darkness and age would you mind walking with me up to my cabin ollie asked of course not i said and we went down the long street past the theatre the trading post and the saloon till we came to the hill where her little nest was perched every one spoke and smiled to her and she answered in the same way though i knew she was on parade and holding herself with firm hands as we came near to the end and her pace quickened however and i guessed the panic that was on her to be alone where she could drop her mask and become a woman a poor weak grief-stricken woman but when we were inside at last her manner astounded me she didn't throw herself on her couch nor go to pieces as i had dreaded but turned on me with burning eyes and her hands tight clenched while her voice was throaty and hoarse the words came tumbling out in confusion i've let him go she said yes and you helped me only for you i'd have broken down but i want you to know i've done one good thing at last in my miserable life i've held in here he never knew he never knew oh god what fools men are yes i said you did mighty well he's a sensitive chap and if you'd broken down he'd have felt awful bad what she grasped me by the coat lapels and shook me yes that weak little woman shook me while her face went perfectly livid he'd have felt badly eh man man didn't you see are you blind why he asked me to go with him he asked me to marry him think of it that great wonderful man asked me to be his wife me olive marceau the dancer oh oh isn't it funny why don't you laugh i didn't laugh i stood there picking pieces of fur out of my cap and wondering if ever i should see another woman like this one she paced about over the skin rugs tearing at the throat of her dress as if it choked her there were no tears in her eyes but her whole frame shook and shuddered as if from great cold deep set in her bones why didn't you go i asked stupidly you love him don't you you know why i didn't go she cried fiercely i couldn't how could i go back and meet his mother some day she'd find me out and it would spoil his life no no if only she hadn't recovered no i don't mean that either i'm not his kind that's all oh god i let him go i let him go and he never knew she was writhing now on her bed in a perfect frenzy calling to him brokenly stretching out her arms while great dry coughing sobs wrenched her 
little one i said unsteadily and my throat ached so that i couldn't trust myself you're a brave girl and you're his kind or anybody's kind with that the rain came and so i left her alone with her comforting misery when i told kink he sputtered like a pinwheel and every evening thereafter we too went up to her house and sat with her we could do this because she'd quit the theatre the day the boat took prosser away and she wouldn't heed eckert's offers to go back i'm through with it for good she told us though i don't know what else i'm good for you see i don't know anything useful but i suppose i can learn now if i wasn't married already i said hm snorted kink i ain't so young as neither one of my partners miss but i'm possessed of rare intellectual treasures she laughed at both of us when a week had passed after the first boat went down with prosser we began to look daily for the first up-river steamer bringing word direct from the outside world it came one midnight and as we were getting dressed to go to the landing our tent was torn open and montague tumbled in upon us what brought you back we questioned when we'd finished mauling him it was june and the nights were as light as day in this latitude so we could see his face plainly why uh he hesitated for an instant then threw back his head squared his great young shoulders and looked us in the eyes while all his embarrassment fled i came back to marry olive marceau said he i came to take her back home to the little mother he stared out wistfully at the distant southern mountains effulgent and glorified by the midnight sun which lay so close behind their crests and i winked at martin she's left what he whirled quickly the theatre and i don't suppose you can see her until tomorrow disappointment darkened his face besides kink added gloomily when you quit her like a dog i slicked myself up some and i ain't any way sure she'll care to see you now only just as a friend of mine notice i've cut my whiskers don't you we made monty pay for that instant's hesitation the last he ever had and then i said you walk up the river trail for a quarter of a mile and wait if i can persuade her to come out at this hour i'll send her to you no you couldn't find her she's moved since you left i wouldn't gamble none on her meetin you martin said discouragingly and combed out his new-mown beard with ostentation she was up the moment i knocked and when i said that a man needed help i heard her murmur sympathetically as she dressed when we came to our tent i stopped her he's up yonder a piece said i you run along while i fetch kink and the medicine kit we'll overtake you is it anything serious yes it's apt to be unless you hurry he seems to think he needs you pretty badly and so she went up the river trail to where he was waiting her way golden with the beams of the sun whose rim peeped at her over the far-off hills and there in the free still air among the virgin spruce with the clean sweet moss beneath their feet they met the good sun smiled broadly at them now and the grim yukon hurried past chuckling under its banks and swiggering among the roots while the song it sang was of spring and of long bright days that had no night end of story nine story ten of the crimson gardenia and other tales of adventure by rex beach this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story 10. McGill The ice was running when McGill arrived. Had he been two hours later, he might have fared badly, for the ramparts above Ophir choked the river down into a narrow chute through which it hurries, snarling, and the shore ice was widening at the rate of a foot an hour early in the day the recorder from alder creek had tried to come ashore but had broken through losing his skiff and saving his life by the sheer good luck that favors fools and drunken men it was october the last mail had gone out a fortnight previous the wiseacres were laying odds that the river would be closed in three days so it was close running that mcgill made six hundred miles in an open whip-sawed dory 
they heard him calling once he saw the lights and getting down to the water level they could make out his boat crunching along through the thin ice at the outer edge he was trying to force his way inward to a point where the current would not move him but the yukon spun him like a top and it looked as if he would go past fortunately however there happened to be a man in the crowd who had learned tricks with a lariat back in oklahoma a line was put out and mcgill came ashore with his bedding under one arm and a sheet-iron stove under the other stoves were scarce that winter and mcgill was no tenderfoot they obtained their first good look at him when he lined up with the crowd at hopper's bar ten minutes later by which time it was known who he was he had a great big frame with a great big face on top of it and judging from his reputation he had a great big heart to match them both some of the late comers recalled a tale of how he had lifted the gunnels out of a poling boat that was wedged in a timber jam above white horse and from the looks of his massive hands and shoulders the tale seemed true he was not handsome few strong men are but he had level blue eyes rather small and deep-set and a jaw that made people think twice before angering him while his voice carried the rumbling bass note one hears at the edge of a spring freshet when the boulders are shifting i missed the last boat from circle he explained so i took a chance with the skiff looks like you'd be the last arrival before the trails open offered hopper i don't guess there's nobody behind you i didn't pass anybody said mcgill and it was plain from his smile that he had made good time aim to winter here dan i do minnick told me four summers ago that he'd found a prospect near here and i've always figured on putting some holes down but it looks like i'm late oh there's plenty of ground open you've got as good a chance as the balance of us any grub in camp nope ophir was struck too late in the fall mcgill laughed i didn't think there would be but that's nothing new didn't you bring none nary a pound there's women and children at the circle and there wasn't more than enough for them so i pulled out there's plenty below hopper assured him how far we don't know yet there's a boatload of chicago's bound for dawson somewhere between here and cochran's landing they'll be froze in now and tenderfeet always has grub soon's we get some more snow we'll do some freightin before he retired that night mcgill had bought a town lot and a week later there was a cabin on it for he was a man who knew how to work then during the interval between the close of navigation and the opening of winter travel he looked over the country and staked some claims he did not locate at random but used a discrimination based upon ten years experience in the arctics and when cold weather set in he felt satisfied with his work men with half his holdings reckoned their fortunes at extravagant figures transfers of unproved properties for handsome terms were common millions were made daily on paper soon after the winter had settled two strangers mushed in from down river for ten days they had pulled their own sled through the first dry trackless snow of the season and they were well spent but they brought news that the steamboat was in winter quarters a hundred and fifty miles below they assured mcgill moreover that there was plenty of food aboard so a day later he set off on their back trail with his dog team by now the melancholy autumn was gone the air was frozen clean of every taint the frost made men's blood gallop through their veins it changed mcgill into a boy again his lungs ached from the throbbing power within him his loping stride was as smooth as that of a timber wolf his loud deep laughter caused the dogs to yelp in answer when he finally burst out of the silence and into the midst of the gold seekers with tidings of the new camp only a hundred and fifty miles away they shook off their lethargy and awoke to a great excitement he told all he honestly knew about ophir and with nimble fancies they added two words of their own to every one of his they stopped work upon their winter quarters and made ready to push on afoot on hands and knees if necessary here was a man who had made a fortune in one short autumn for with the customary ignorance of tenderfeet they perceived no distinction between a mining claim and a mine a gold mine they reasoned was worth anything one wished to imagine from a hundred thousand to a million 
thirty gold mines were worth thirty millions figure it out for yourself the conservative ones cut the result in half and were well satisfied with it they were glad they had come the steamboat captain offered mcgill a bed in his own cabin for the log houses were not yet completed and that night at supper the miner met the rest of the big family among them was a girl once mcgill had beheld her he could see none of the others he became an automaton directing his words at random but focusing his soul upon her he could not recall her name for her first glance had driven all memory out of his head and during the meal he feasted his hungry eyes upon her feeling a yearning such as he had never before experienced he did not pause to argue what it foretold it is doubtful if he would have realized had he taken time to think for he had never known women well and ten years in the yukon country had dimmed what youthful recollections he possessed when he went to bed he was in a daze that did not vanish even when the captain after carefully locking the doors and closing the cabin shutters crawled under the bunk and brought forth a five-gallon keg of whiskey which he fondled like a mother her babe wait till you taste it crooned the old man nothing like it north of vancouver if i didn't keep it hid i'd have a mutiny he removed a steaming kettle from the stove then unearthing some sugar from the chart case mixed a toddy muttering just wait that's all you just wait with the pains of a chemist he divided the beverage into two equal portions rolled the contents of his own glass under his tongue with a look of beatitude on his wrinkled features then inquired what did i tell you it's great miguel acknowledged first real liquor i've tasted for months then he fell to staring at the fire after a time he asked who's the lady i was talking to the one with the red sweater yes miss andrews her first name is alice alice mcgill spoke it softly i suppose she's married of course no miss andrews mcgill started i thought she was the wife of that nice-looking feller barclay the captain grunted and then after a moment added she's an actor of some kind mcgill opened his eyes in genuine astonishment he opened his mouth also but changed his mind and fell to studying the flames once more she's plumb beautiful he said at length all actors are beautiful the captain remarked wisely mcgill slept badly that night which was unusual for him but when he went to feed his dogs on the following morning he found miss andrews ahead of him what splendid creatures she said petting them do you like dogs he queried i love them you know these are the first i've ever seen of this kind then you never rode behind a team no i have only read about such things mcgill summoned his courage and said maybe you'd like me to, to, to give you a ride would you oh mr mcgill she clapped her hands and her eyes widened at the prospect he noted how the brisk air had brought the blood to her cheeks but broke off the dangerous contemplation of her charms and fell to harnessing the team his fingers stiff with embarrassment he helped her into the basket sled and then at her request tucked in the folds of her coat it was a novel sensation and one he had never dreamed of having for he would not have dared touch any woman without a command it was not much of a ride for the trails were poor but the girl seemed to enjoy it and to mcgill it was wonderful he felt that he was making an awful spectacle of himself however and hoped no one had seen them leave he was so big and so ungainly to be playing squire and above all he was so old he could think of nothing to say on the excursion but when she thanked him upon their return he was more than paid for his misery as they drove up barclay was watching them from the high bank and miss andrews waved a mitten at him later when mcgill had left for a moment the young man began sourly making a play for the old party eh huh? he isn't old said miss andrews carelessly what's the idea i don't know that i have any idea why uh, i'm interested naturally you needn't be it's every one for himself up here and you don't seem to be getting ahead very fast i see mcgill's due to be a millionaire and i'm down and out barclay sneered well we're neither of us children if you can land him more power to you i wouldn't stand in your way said miss andrews coldly and i don't intend that you shall stand in mine 
is that the only way you look at it barclay wore an ugly frown that seemed genuine she met it with a mere shrug causing him to exclaim hotly if you don't care any more than that i won't interfere he turned and walked away those were wonderful days for mcgill instead of hurrying back to his work he loitered with a splendid disregard of convention he followed the girl about hourly and was too drunk with her smiles to hear the comment his actions evoked he had moments of despair when he saw himself as a great awkward bear more aptly designed to frighten than to woo a woman but these periods of depression gave way to the keenest delight at some word of encouragement from alice andrews he did not fully realize that he had asked her to marry him until it was all over but she seemed to understand so fully what was in his heart that she had drawn it from him before he really knew what he was saying and then the joy of her acceptance it stunned him when he had finally torn himself away from her side he went out and stood bareheaded under the northern lights to let it sink in there were no words in his vocabulary no thoughts in his mind capable of expressing the marvel of it the gorgeous colors that leaped from horizon to zenith were no more glorious than the riot that flamed within his soul she loved him dan mcgill and she was a white woman when he thought how beautiful and young she was his heart overflowed with a gentle tenderness which rivalled that of any mother still in a dream he related the miracle to the steamboat captain who took the announcement in silence this old man had wintered inside the circle and knew something of the woman hunger that comes to strong men in solitude he was observant moreover and had seen good girls made bad by the fires of the frontier as well as bad women made good by marriage there being no priest nearer than nulato it was perforce a contract marriage a lawyer in the party attended to the papers and it pleased the woman to have barclay sign as a witness then she and mcgill set out for ophir a trip he never forgot the sled was laden with things to make a bride comfortable so they were forced to walk but they might have been flying for all he knew alice was very ignorant of northern ways childishly so and it afforded him the keenest delight to initiate her into the mysteries of trail life and when night drew near and they made camp what joy it was to hear her exclamations of wonder at his adeptness she loved to see his axe sink to the eye in the frozen fir trunks and to join his shout when the tree fell crashing in a great upheaval of white then when their tiny tent nestling in some sheltered grove was glowing from the candlelight and the red-hot stove had rooted the cold he would make her lie back on the fragrant springy couch of boughs while he smoked and did the dishes and told her shyly of the happiness that had come upon him he waited upon her hand and foot he stood between her and every peril of the wilds and while it was all delightfully bewildering to him it was likewise very strange and exciting to his bride the deathly silence of the bitter nights illumined only by the awesome aurora borealis the terrific immensity of the solitudes with their white burdened forests of fir that ran up and over the mountains and away to the ends of the world the wild wolf-dogs that feared nothing except the voice of their master and yet fawned upon him with a passion that approached ferocity it all played upon the woman's fancy strangely for the first time in her tempestuous career she was nearly happy it was worth some sacrifice to possess the devotion of a man like mcgill it was worth even more to know that her years of uncertainty and strife were over his gentleness annoyed her at times but on the other hand she was grateful for the shyness that handicapped him as a lover on the whole however it was a good bargain and she was fairly well content as for mcgill he expanded he effloresced if such a nature as his could be said to bloom he explored the hindermost recesses of his being and brought forth his secrets for her to share he told her all about himself without the slightest reservation and when he was done she knew him clear to his last least thought it was an unwise thing to do but mcgill was not a wise man and the story seemed to please her above all she took an interest in his business affairs which was gratifying 
time and again she questioned him shrewdly about his mining properties which made him think that here was a woman who would prove a helpmate their arrival at ophir was the occasion for a rough spontaneous welcome that further turned her head mcgill was loved and once his townsmen had recovered from their amazement they did their best to show his wife courtesies which all went to strengthen her belief in his importance and to add to her complacence mcgill was ashamed of his cabin at first but she surprised him with the business-like manner in which she went about fixing it up before his admiring eyes she transformed it by a few deft touches into what seemed to him a paradise heretofore he had witnessed women's handiwork only from a distance and had never possessed a real home so this was another wonder that it took time to appreciate eventually he pulled himself together and settled down to his affairs but in the midst of his task it would sometimes come over him with a blinding rush that he was married and that he had a wife who was no squaw but a white woman more beautiful than any dream creature and so young that he might have been her father the amazing strangeness of it never left him but the adolescence of ophir was short it quickly outgrew its age of fictitious values and its rapturous delusions vanished as hole after hole was put to bedrock and betrayed no pay entire valleys that were formerly considered rich were abandoned and the driving snows erased the signs of human effort men came in out of the hills cursing the luck that had brought them there the gold-bearing area narrowed to a proved creek or two where the ground was taken and where there were ten men for every job the saloons began to fill with idlers who talked much but spent nothing one day the camp awakened to the fact that it was a failure there is nothing more ghastly than a broken mining town for in place of the first feverish exhilaration there is naught but the wreck of hopes and the ruin of ambitions mcgill's wife was not the last to appreciate the truth she saw it coming even earlier than the rest once she had lost the first glamour and fully attuned herself to the new life she was sufficiently perceptive to realize her great mistake but mcgill did not notice the change and saw nothing to worry about in the town's affairs he had been poor most of his life and his rare periods of opulence had ended briefly therefore this failure meant merely another trial ophir had given him his prize greater than all the riches of its namesake and who could be other than happy with a wife like this his very optimism combined with her own fierce disappointment drove the woman nearly frantic she felt abused she reasoned that mcgill had betrayed her and at last owned to the hunger she had been striving vainly to stifle for months past now that there was nothing to gain why blind herself to the truth she hated mcgill and she loved another there had never been an instant when her heart had not called and then to make matters worse barclay came he had spent most of the long winter at the steamboat landing being too angry to show himself in ophir but the woman hunger had grown upon him as upon all men in the north and it finally drew him to her with a strength that would have snapped iron chains hearing shortly after his arrival that mcgill was out on the creeks and never returned until dark he went to the cabin alice opened the door at his knock then fell back with a cry he shut out the cold air behind him and stood looking at her until she gasped why have you come here why because i couldn't stay away you knew i'd have to come didn't you mcgill she whispered and cast a frightened look over her shoulder does he know she shook her head i hear he's broke like the rest barclay laughed mockingly and she nodded have you had enough yes yes oh yes she wailed suddenly take me away bob oh take me away she was in his arms with the words her breast to his her arms about his neck her hot tears starting she clutched him wildly while he covered her face with kisses don't scold me she sobbed don't i'm sorry i'm sorry you'll take me away won't you hush he commanded i can't take you away there's no place to go to that's the worst of this damned country he'd follow and he'd get us 
you must bob you must i'll die here with him i've stood it as long as i can don't be a fool you'll have to go through with it now until spring once the river is open no 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 she cried passionately do you want us to get killed mrs mcgill shivered as if some wintry blast had searched out her marrow then freed herself from his embrace and said slowly you're right bob we must be very careful i don't know what he might do that evening she met mcgill with a smile the first she had worn for some time and she was particularly affectionate instead of returning down river barclay found lodgings and remained in ophir he was not the most industrious of men and before long became a familiar figure around the few public places mcgill met him frequently seeing which barclay's fellow-passengers from below raised their eyebrows and muttered meaningless commonplaces then when the younger man took to spending more and more of his time at the miner's cabin they ceased making any comment whatever these are things that wise men avoid and a loose tongue often leads to an early grave when fellows like mcgill are about some of the old-timers who had wintered with the miner in the upper country shook their heads and acknowledged that young barclay was a braver man than they gave him credit for being of course mcgill was the last to hear of it for he was of the simple sort who have faith in god and women and such things and he might have gone on indefinitely in ignorance but for hopper who did not care much for the barclay person the saloon man being himself uneducated and rough like mcgill cherished certain illusions regarding virtue and let drop a hint his friend could not help but heed the husband paid for his drink then went back to the rear of the room where he sat for an hour or more when he went home he was more gentle to his wife than ever he brooded for a number of days trying to down his suspicion but the poison was sown and he finally spoke to her barclay was here again this afternoon wasn't he she turned her face away to hide its pallor yes he dropped in he was here yesterday and the day before too wasn't he well he'd ought to stay away people are talking she turned on him defiantly what of it what do i care i'm lonesome i want company mr barclay and i were good friends you're my wife now your wife ah your wife she laughed hysterically yes don't you love me any more alice she said nothing i've noticed a change lately and i can't blame you none but if you loved me just a little if i had even that much to start on i wouldn't mind i'd take you away somewhere and try to make you love me more you'd take me away would you the woman cried gaining confidence from his lack of heat away where i'd be all alone with you don't you see i'm dying of lonesomeness now that's what's the matter i'm half mad with the monotony i want to see people and live and be amused i'm young and pretty and men like me you're old mcgill you're old and i'm young her husband withered beneath her words his whole big frame sagged together as if the life had ebbed out of it he felt weary and sick and burned out his brain held but one thought alice did not love him because he was old don't go on this way he said finally to check her i suppose it's true but i felt like a daddy and a mother to you along with the other feelings and i hoped you wouldn't notice it i don't reckon any young man could care for you like that you see it's all the loves of my whole life wrapped up together and i don't see i don't see what we can do about it we're married it was characteristic of him that he could devise no way out of the difficulty a calamity had befallen them and they must adjust themselves to it as best they could in his eyes marriage was a holy thing an institution of god with which no human hands might trifle no he continued you're my wife and so we've got to get along the best way we can i know you couldn't do anything wrong you ain't that kind his eyes roved over the homely little nest and the evidences of their married intimacy no you couldn't do that then you won't make it any harder for me than you can help no he rose stiffly you're entitled to a fair show at anything you want i don't like barclay but if you want him around i don't object 
try to be as happy as you can alice maybe it'll all come out right only i wish you'd known it wasn't love before you married me he put on his cap and went out into the cold during the ensuing week or two he devoted himself to his work spending every daylight hour on his claim in this way more than satisfying barclay and the woman who felt that a great menace had been removed but hopper determined that his friend should know all and not part of the truth for good men are rare and weak women in the way so he put on his parka and walked out to the place where mcgill was working and there under a bleak march sky with the snow flurries wrapping their legs about he told what he had learned hopper was a little man but he had courage i've heard it from half a dozen fellers he concluded and they'd ought to know because they come up on the same boat with him anyhow you can satisfy yourself easy enough mcgill moistened his lips and thanking his informant said now you'd better hustle back to camp we're due for a storm it was still early afternoon when he walked swiftly out of the gulch and into the straggling little town on his way down from the claim the blizzard had broken or so it seemed for the narrow valley had suddenly become filled with a whirling smother through which he burst like a ship through a fog when he emerged upon the flats he saw that it was no more than a squall and the wind was abating again his moccasins made no sound as he came up to his own house and the first inkling of his presence that the two inside received was when the door opened and he stood before them something in his bearing caused his wife to clutch at the table for support and barclay to retreat with his back to the opposite wall his hand inside his coat mcgill never carried a weapon having yet to feel the need of one he spoke now in a harsh cracked voice take your hands off that gun barclay what's the matter with you the younger man questioned mrs mcgill's eyes were wide with terror her frame racked by apprehension when her husband turned upon her and asked is it true do you love him he jerked his head in barclay's direction answer me he rumbled savagely as she hesitated her lips moved and she nodded without removing her gaze from him how long have you loved him when she still could not master herself he softened his voice you needn't be scared alice i wouldn't hurt you a long time she said finally mcgill leveled a look at the other man that's right barclay agreed you might as well know they tell me that you and her had mcgill ground his teeth and his little eyes blazed that she didn't have no right to marry without telling me something about you the former answered through white lips well everybody knew it except you and you could have found out i'd have married her some time myself if you hadn't come along mcgill's fingers opened slowly at which the woman burst forth no 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 don't do that you can't blame him dan i did it don't you understand i'm the one i loved him in frisco long before i saw you and i've loved him ever since take it out on me if you want to but don't hurt him i don't reckon i'd have minded it much if i'd known the truth at the start said mcgill most women have made mistakes at one time or another at least most of those i've known have no it ain't that but you married me knowing that you loved him all the time i tried to quit cried the wife i tried to but i couldn't and what's the rottenest of all mcgill's voice was ugly again you made him best man at the wedding or just the same he stood up with us didn't you barclay the wife flung herself into the breach once more with a self-sacrifice that wrenched her husband's heart he didn't want to but i made him i thought you had money and i was mad at him for letting me go so i tried to hurt him i wanted him to marry me but he wouldn't and i took you when it was over and i saw the kind of man you are i tried to love you honestly i did but i couldn't you're so i couldn't do it that's all she broke into a torrent of tears holding herself on her feet by an effort her wretched sobbing was the only sound in the cabin for a time then barclay inquired well what are you going to do mcgill turned to his wife ignoring barclay i guess i understand things pretty well now and i'm beginning to see your side of course i never aimed to hurt you alice i couldn't but i aimed to kill this man and i will if he stays here over his shoulder he flung out quickly oh the gun won't help you none you gotta go barclay 
i'll go with him cried mrs mcgill desperately if he goes i'll go too that's exactly what you've got to do you can't stay here now neither of you if he ain't able to take care of you why i will as long as i live but you've both got to go it's the best course under the circumstances barclay agreed with relief we'll take the first boat you'll go to-day now said the husband grimly before i have time to think it over but where to hell that's where you're headed we can't go afoot the woman cried in a panic i've got dogs and don't argue or i'll weaken i'm letting him go because you seem to need him alice only remember one thing both of you there ain't no town big enough to hold all three of us now go quick before i change my mind for if the sun ever goes down on barclay and me together so help me god it won't rise on both of us there ain't no place in the world that's big enough for him and me no place in the world mcgill stood on the river bank and watched them vanish into the ghostly curtain that sifted slowly down from the heavens and when they were finally lost to view he turned back to his empty cabin before entering he paused as usual to note the weather it was a habit he saw that the sky was strangely leaden and low and in spite of the fact that the quick was falling rapidly the air was lifeless and close if mcgill was any judge that squall had been but a warning and foretold more to follow he sighed miserably at the thought of the night his wife would have to face he cooked his supper mechanically then sat for hours staring at it the wind rattling at his door finally roused him to the knowledge that his fire was out and the room was chilly being unable longer to bear the silence and the mute evidences of her occupation that looked at him from every side he slipped into his parka and went down to hopper's place where there was life and human voices at least the night was yelling with a million voices when he stepped out the bitter wind snapped his fur garment as if to rend it to ribbons the whirling particles of snow rasped his face like the dry grains from a sand blast boreas had loosed his demons and they were lashing the night into chaos mcgill felt a sudden tender concern for the woman a concern so great as almost to destroy his bitterness but he reflected that he had seen to loading the sled himself and among the other paraphernalia had included a tent and a stove unless barclay was a fool therefore alice was perfectly safe there was wood aplenty and the spruce forest offered shelter from the gale the thought awakened a memory of those night camps he had made on that dreamlike wedding journey and brought forth a groan how old and spiritless he had become he could scarcely stand against the wind of course the story had gone broadcast hours before for other eyes than his had watched the man and woman take the outbound trail that afternoon so when he came stumbling into hopper's place a sudden silence fell he went directly to the bar and called for straight hooch to drive the cold from his bones but although it warmed his flesh his soul remained numb and frozen inside him was a great aching emptiness that even hopper's kindly words could not reach looks like the worst night we've had this year said the proprietor better have a drink with me mcgill's teeth rattled on the glass when he put it to his lips she's gone he whispered staring across the bar and i didn't kill him i, I couldn't on her account hopper nodded i'm awfully sorry it came out this way dan mcgill shivered and drew his head down between his gaunt shoulders talk to me will ya he begged i'm hit hard his friend did as he was directed but a few minutes later in the midst of his words the big man interrupted there wasn't room for all of us here he declared fiercely i told her that but she wanted him worse than her own life so i had to give in they were still talking at midnight after all but a few loiterers had gone home when they heard a man's voice calling from outside an instant later the front door burst open and a figure appeared it was cochran the trader from down river here give me a hand he bellowed through his ice burdened beard then plunged back into the hurricane to reappear with a woman in his arms i thought i'd never make it he declared there's a man in the sled too get some hooch and send for a doctor quick 
McGill uttered a cry, while the hand with which he gripped the bar went white at his pressure. "'Where did you get them?' he questioned. Ten miles below,' said Cochrane. "'I was camped for the night when their dogs picked up my scent. They were half dead when they got to me, and he was in mighty bad shape. So I came through. I've been five hours on the road.' two men brought in barclay at which mcgill flung out a long arm and cried in a loud voice is that man dead no one answered so he strode forward only to have the weakened traveller raise his head and say no i'm not dead mcgill but we had to come back the wife was calling to her husband wretchedly don't do it dan we couldn't help it we'll go to-morrow we'll go please don't we'll go the onlookers knowing something of the tragedy drew back watching mcgill who still stared into the face of the man who had robbed him of everything do you remember what i told you he questioned inflexibly barclay nodded and the woman shrilled again don't let him do it men don't there ain't room for us here went on mcgill only to-night supplicated his wife the frost-bitten spots in her cheeks no more pallid than the rest of her countenance he can't go don't you see he isn't able wait dan i'll go if you want me to she struggled forward i'll go but he'll die if you send him out it's always him ain't it said the miner slowly you seem to want him pretty bad alice well you can have him and you can stay both of you he drew his cap down over his grizzled hair and turned toward the door but hopper saw the light in his eye and intercepted him i'll go home with you dan said he i ain't going home you mean there ain't room enough in ophir for barclay and me and the woman my god man listen to that blizzard it's suicide but mcgill only repeated dully there ain't room hopper there ain't room and with the gait of an old man shambled to the door when he opened it the storm shrieked in glee and rushed in wrapping him up to the middle in its embrace he closed the door behind him then went stumbling off into the night and as he crept blindly forth upon the frozen bosom of the river, the bellowing wind wiped out his footprints an arm's length at his back. End of story 10story eleven of the crimson gardenia and other tales of adventure by rex beach this librivox recording is in the public domain story eleven the brand part one the valley was very still no breath of wind had stirred it for many days it was smothered so heavily in snow that the firs were bent even the bare birch limbs carried precarious burdens and when gravity relieved some sagging branch the mass beneath welcomed the avalanche so softly that the only sound was a whisper as the bough returned to its position the brooding cold had cleared the air of sound as it had of moisture no birds piped there was no murmur of running water no evidence of animal life except an occasional wavering line etched into the white by the feet of some tiny rodent the rolling hills were sparsely timbered against an empty north sky a jumble of saw-toothed peaks were limbed like carvings and everywhere was the same unending hush of winter the desolation was complete yet there was life here for spaced at regular intervals across the gulch were mounds of white each forming the lips of a rectangular cavity resembling an open grave they were perfectly aligned and separated from each other by precisely thirty paces surrounding each was a clearing out of which freshly cut stumps protruded bearing snow caps fashioned like the chapeau of a drum major there were six of these holes and a seventh was in process of digging over the last one a crude windlass straddled and the heap of debris at its feet showed raw and dirty against the snow out of the aperture a thin vapour rose lazily coating the drum and rope with rime from the clearing a narrow trail wound to a cabin beside the creek bank mcgill came out into the morning and with him came his three giant malamutes wolf gray shaggy and silent like their master he eyed the drooping white-robed forest and the desolate ridges that shut him in then said in a voice harsh from disuse hello people anything happened yet 
he made it a practice to speak aloud whenever he thought of it for the hush of an arctic winter plays pranks with a person's mind and there is a certain effect of sanity in spoken words senseless though they be after a moment he repeated his greeting good morning i said can't you answer then his cheeks flamed above his heavy beard and he yelled loudly good morning you blank can't you say anything he glared reproachfully at a giant spruce from the lower limbs of which depended the quarters of several caribou tom you ain't gone back on me say hello you and me are friends speak up after a time he shook his head murmuring it's no use i've got to make all the noise there is if it would only blow or something i'd like to hear the wind he strode toward the prospect hole the dogs following sedately their feet making no sound in the snow they too felt the weight of isolation and never left his side arriving at the dump mcgill stood motionless beside the windlass for a long time staring into nothingness with eyes that were strained and miserable when the cold bit him he roused himself and addressed the steam-filled opening dispiritedly so you didn't freeze up on me that's good i'll get bedrock to-day and show you up for a dirty cheat pay bah there ain't none he descended a ladder at one end of the shaft gathered the charred logs tied them into a bundle with the end of the windlass rope then mounting the ladder hoisted them to the surface next hooking on the ungainly wooden bucket he lowered it after which he descended for a second time there began a long and monotonous series of ascents and descents for every bucket of gravel meant two journeys the full depth of the pit it was a tedious and primitive process involving a tremendous waste of effort but he was methodical and each time the tub rose it carried a burden sufficient to tax the strength of two men he handled it easily however and by midday had removed the thawed ground and scraped a sample from close to frost he laid a light fire then took the heaping gold pan under his arm and set off for his cabin accompanied by the malamutes when he had prepared and eaten his lunch he seated himself before his panning tub a square box half filled with water melted from the creek ice and began the process of testing his prospect having worked down the gravel and sediment to a half handful he spread it with a movement of his wrists leaving stranded at the tail of the black sand a few specks of yellow these he eyed for a moment before washing them away too light as usual he said aloud the dogs stirred and raised their heads always pretty near but not quite but it's here somewhere and i'll get it if i can last out this damned silence that rimrock didn't lie and old pitka didn't lie either nobody lies except women he scowled at some remembrance his whole face retreated behind a bristling mask of ferocity he sat motionless over the tub of muddy water until the fire died out of the stove and the chill warned him that it was time to resume work for many weeks how many mcgill neither knew nor cared he had pursued the routine of his search he had penetrated this valley alone unseen in the late autumn and every day since then he had labored steadily mechanically almost without physical sensation for all feeling was centered in his memory which never gave him time to consider his surroundings spring was coming now the sun was already peeping over the southern hills in the middle of its daily journey and during this time there had been but two interruptions which had roused him from his apathy one had occurred when in quest of fresh meat he had discovered that he had neighbors ten miles to the west he had seen their camp from the divide then had turned and slunk away cursing them for intruding upon his privacy the other was when a herd of caribou had crossed at that time he had given a brief rein to his desire to kill seeing ahead of his sights the face of the man who had sent him into the wilderness he could have bagged half the herd but checked himself in time realizing that it was not barclay at whom he leveled his rifle but defenceless animals the carcasses of which were useless barclay the name maddened mcgill he wondered dully why he continued to work so steadily when barclay had robbed him of the need for gold 
the answer to this he supposed was easier than the answer to those other questions that forever troubled him he had to do something or die of his thoughts and he knew no other work than this even in his busiest hours memories of barclay and the woman obtruded themselves it was dark when he had fired the hole a second time and returned to his cabin he had not reached bedrock and this fact irritated him he was growing very irritable it seemed lighting his pipe of rank sheep dip tobacco when the supper dishes were finally cleaned and the dogs fed he once more prepared for the profitless process of panning but he noticed that this sample of gravel was different to any he had yet found being of a peculiar ashen colour he felt it with practised fingers and discovered it to be gritty and full of sediment feels good he said aloud but i'll bet it's barren he had panned so many samples that all eagerness all curiosity as to the outcome had long since disappeared therefore his movements were purely perfunctory as he dissolved the clay lumps and washed the gravels down he paused halfway through the operation to dry his hands and relight his pipe then fell to thinking of barclay and the woman once more and remained so for a long time when he resumed his task it was with glazed unseeing eyes he was about to dump the last dregs carelessly when something just slipping over the edge of the pan caught his eye and caused him to tilt the receptacle abruptly the breath whistling in his throat roused the dogs mcgill closed his eyes for an instant then reached unsteadily for the candle a movement of his wrist ran the water across the pan bottom and spread the black sand thinly instantly there leaped out against the black metal a heap of bright clean yellow particles which lay as if glued together coarse gold coarse gold he whispered then cursed in the weak meaningless manner of men under great excitement not trusting himself to hold the pan he set it upon the table but without removing his eyes from it when his nerves had steadied he ran the prospect down all the time muttering in his beard he dried it over the fire blew the iron sand free with his breath then pushed the particles into a heap striving to estimate their value there's half an ounce he said finally eight dollars a pan god that's big big it's another klondike he rose and ran bareheaded out into the night followed by the dogs then stood staring at the smoke as it ascended vertically above his shaft like a giant night-growing plant of some kind he was tempted to descend the ladder and tear the crackling logs apart but thought better of it swinging his eyes along the valley rim that stood out black against the aurora he lifted his long arms it's mine all mine understand he cried the words loudly wildly as if challenging the silence it's no good to me but it's mine and by god i'll keep it mcgill reached bedrock the next evening and spent most of the night panning the pile of scrapings he had collected from the bottom of the pit if the top of the streak had been rich the lower concentration was amazing every seam in the shattered limestone which stood on end like sluice riffles contained little flattened pumpkin seeds of gold they lay embedded in the clay stringers like plums in a pudding or as if some lavish hand had inserted them there as coins are slipped into the slot of a child's savings bank he could see them before the dirt was half washed but took a supreme pleasure nevertheless in watching the yellow pile grow as the sediment disappeared a baking powder can was half filled when he had finished it told him unmistakably the magnitude of his riches he was a wealthy man wealthier than he had ever dreamed of being there was more where this came from and the gulch lay unappropriated from end to end fortune had come in a day and he would never want so long as he lived his thoughts were wild and chaotic for he was half mad from the silence but what use to make of his discovery he hardly knew since he had slunk away from the world ablaze with hatred for his fellow-men intending to live alone for the rest of his days his grudge was as bitter now as then and he determined therefore to keep his find a secret 
that would be a grim if unsatisfactory sort of revenge he reflected he would take what he wished and let other men wear out their lives searching unsuccessfully those strangers to the westward for instance would toil and suffer through the long winter then leave discouraged there was money here for them and for hundreds thousands like them but he decided to guard his secret and to let it die with him mcgill pictured the result of this news as he gave it out the stampede the headlong rush that would bring men from every corner of the north he saw this silent valley bared of its brooding forest and filled with people he saw a log city in the flats down by the river he heard the bass blasts of steamboats the shrilling of sawmills the sound of music from dance halls the click of checks and roulette balls the noise of revelry no 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 he rose and shouted into the empty silence of his cabin i won't do it i won't i won't but the voices called to him all through the night he rose early for they would not let him rest and during the darkness a terrible hunger had grown upon him it was the hunger for companionship for speech his secret was too great for imprisonment it threatened to burst the confines of the valley by its own tremendous force he knew he could never sleep with it for it would smother him vampire-like it would suck the life from his veins and the reason from his brain when he had eaten he pocketed the baking powder tin slipped into his snowshoes and crossing the gulch climbed the westward hills that hid his neighbors and the dogs went with him End of story eleven part one